Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Nosek. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about how our laboratory has been trying to wrestle with some of the lessons that Laura described in the first talk, uh, and, uh, and things that, you know, as we know, have been of great attention recently, but have been known to be issues for a long time. Uh, and the particular thing that I'd like to focus on is the challenges of putting that into practice. It's very easy for us to talk about what the ideals are, but we, construct, we confront major constraints uh, and motivational barriers that make it more difficult for us to do it. And we can start with a very simple statement about what the goal of science is, which is simply to accumulate knowledge about nature. We're trying to learn stuff, we're exploring, we are involved in the largest public works project in history, building a body of knowledge about how that body, that history and people and things work. Uh, but that science itself is an abstract concept. It doesn't actually have goals. It's done by scientists. And me and my lab mates as scientists, we do have and share that goal. We want to accumulate knowledge about nature. We got into science because we're curious. Uh, we want to understand stuff. We like figuring stuff out. Uh, but it isn't our only goal. We also, uh, well, I have a job, but not all of them uh, do. They want to get a job. Uh, they'd like to keep that job. Uh, we'd like to earn our rewards uh, and accolades. Uh, and we'd like to feel good about what we're doing, and that we're making a contribution, that we're adding something uh, to our chosen discipline. And so those ad additional goals add additional motivations for how it is we engage with their everyday science. Uh, and for us, a particular issue that we're trying to resolve in our lab and in our daily practice is a divide in our incentives. The incentives for my success in the way that science is practiced now is focused on me publishing, publishing regularly and publishing in prestigious places, and not necessarily on actually getting it right. And that conflict in incentives is a difficult one to bridge for implementing some of the practices that might make my science more credible. So we can illustrate this by talking about a couple of different papers in the abstract. Right? Paper A is one that we do in the lab when we run two studies and we report uh, those showing clear support for the hypothesis that we generated. The data collection itself was two studies. We did the entire data collection, we analyzed the data according to our original plans for how we would analyze it, uh, and then we reported the results as we analyzed it. Paper B, we did three studies. Uh, we report all three of those. One of them shows clear support for the hypothesis as we've had it. One of it's kind of mixed, not really there, and one doesn't show it at all. Right? We did the same sort of process. We completed our data collection, we analyzed how we plan to analyze it, uh, and we reported all the results. Between these two, knowing nothing about the content of the papers, paper A is a better paper than paper B. We aim for A papers in our lab. We want to be finding stuff that we have these brilliant ideas for in advance, finding clear support for them, and then sharing them with everyone else so they can be amazed at all the things that we thought of before we even knew what was going to happen. But the practice every day is much more like B. We're in a space that we don't understand. We're doing the research because we don't understand it. We don't know exactly how things are gonna turn out. We're working on hard problems. And so a lot of mixed support happens. But paper B isn't going to be as publishable as paper A because it's not telling the clean, beautiful story, providing a novel result uh, and clean findings. But there's also a paper C option, as we know, uh, and that is to report the two studies with two clear support but actually it had done three studies, and in those three studies, we looked at the data while we were collecting and realized, oh, we need a few extra participants for that one because we're right at the margin of getting clear support. We looked at a couple of different ways of analyzing uh, the data and found ones that had worked better, and then we constructed really good rationalizations for why, when it looks better, that's actually the right way to do it. Uh, and then we report the final results at home. Uh, not the other stuff, and then we discard this one that didn't work because clearly it was a pilot, we screwed up the manipulation, I'm sure uh, we should have never done the study in the first place. And so we generate lots of good reasons. With paper C, with just the report, it looks like an A paper. But the evidence of it, the actual evidence, is a B paper. But for publication, if I move to a C paper, that B paper by doing these practices, then I have an A paper. 
I'm much more likely to get published and much more likely to advance. And it's these things that we confront in how it is we make decisions about what we're doing in the laboratory and how we're sharing that evidence every day. We have resources at our disposal and great frontal lobes for rationalizing their use uh, to give ourselves better chances to make our research more publishable. We can peek at the data, we can selectively report things that we've done, and we can present the exploratory analysis as confirmatory. We thought that all along. Now we know from our own literature that even when our incentives are misaligned, uh, if there are very strong norms in a field, those can overcome some of these incentives. They can motivate behaviors uh, that we would be pleased with. Uh, and there are very clear norms for science. Merton in 1973 describes some of the norms of science, right? Communality, right? We share our evidence so that people can expand on it, critique it, evaluate it for its own uh, right. Universalism, we should evaluate research on its own merits. The quality of the research is embodied in the research itself, not in the people around it. Disinterestedness, scientists adopt a motivation for knowledge and discovery. They're just trying to figure things out. Organized skepticism, we consider all evidence that comes to us, even if it conflicts with our original hypotheses, our original theories, our original evidence. And we aim for quality in what we do. Of course, there are also the counter norms for each of these things. Secrecy, keeping it all hidden. Particularism, just believing the research because it's someone famous that did it. Self-interestedness, thinking that this is all a competition and I need to get my results first and not share with you because then you'll maybe get something better than me. Uh, being dogmatic, defending our theories at all costs and aiming for a quantity of results. So if the norms on the left are what dominate our behavior and daily practice, then we may not worry about, as much about this availability of steroids because the norms uh, can drive the behavior that we aspire to uh, in doing good science. And there's data that suggests that these norms are in fact endorsed by almost everyone. This is a very uh, large sample study in Anderson, Martins, and Degrees of scientists across disciplines and in the gray bar are the percent of people who endorse the norms over the counter norms. And in the black are people who endorse the counter norms over the norms. And the ones in slash lines are equal endorsement to those. So more than 90% of people in early career or mid career endorse these norms as how scientific practice ought to operate. When you ask them, okay, what, not what you endorse as practice, what do you do in your daily practice? It's still very strong, but not quite as strong people admit that both of these norms are operating and influential uh, on their behavior. There's still very little endorsement of the counter norms over uh, the norms of science. And then if you ask, don't tell me what you do, tell me what all the other people in your field do, it's terrible. Right? Everybody says, I'm trying to do this well and everybody else around me is trying to do it badly. Uh, or they're doing it badly. They're doing the counter norms. They're all in it for themselves, they're hiding their stuff, they're not sharing. Uh, they're defending their theories at all costs. This is a very difficult situation, as we know, for motivating change in our own behavior. If I think everyone else around me is not behaving according to the norms of science, then how can I start to do that, especially when behaving in the counter norms could advance me in my career? I might get more publications by pursuing practices that would make it more likely that the results look beautiful. So this is a very difficult situation for us to confront. We also know that one intervention for changing the norms is to point out that in fact we all do share the norms, uh, and so that might actually shift our practices. So that's, this is one intervention on its own. So the question that we confront then in our lab is, given this context and uncertainty and this widespread perception of the lack of practice of pursuing the norms of science, how can we succeed if we're going to try to do it cleanly? Because if we just do it clean, then, and there is pervasive use of these practices, then our results aren't going to look as good, and we're going to disadvantage our career, paper after paper, that we try to produce. So the only chance that we can potentially be rewarded, if there is this context that we perceive that there is, uh, then is to, sh to show our work, to do it openly. Right. The president's incentives for publishing are focused mostly on the one thing that we as scientists <clears throat> are not positively not supposed to control, the results. I have complete control over the design, the procedures, the execution of the study, and the results are what they are. With results, the beauty is contingent on what is known about their origin. Obfuscation of methodology can make ugly results appear beautiful. 
But with methodology, it's the opposite. Beauty is revealed by openness. We can be impressed by the quality of the design, the approach, the analysis strategy, how the research actually happened by knowing how it happened. Most science, as we know, has warts. Evidence is halting, it's uncertain, it's incomplete, it's confusing, it's messy, and it is that way because we're working on hard problems. But making results look beautiful when they are not interferes with appreciating the complexity of the problems that we're trying to solve. And whatever the results, the inner beauty, that strong design, the good reasoning, the careful analysis is what ultimately counts. So if nothing is hidden, the quality of the research can be appreciated for what it is and isn't the only way to demonstrate, that is the only way to demonstrate that, that the research isn't juiced. Because you can't tell my B paper, because that's actually how it happened, from an A paper that actually is a C paper. Because you don't know just by the reports that they had different histories in them. So my only opportunity for you to appreciate my, my report with all its bruises and warts and problems is to show you how it is we got there. But just knowing that isn't sufficient for us in the lab to really embrace practices of doing it openly because there's a number of barriers. Some of them are conceptual and some of them are practical. There's a number of conceptual barriers, but the primary one that we wrestle with uh, is the worry of if we make this stuff available, if we give you our access to our materials and our raw data, our analysis scripts, you're going to go in and find out that we did something wrong. You're going to find errors in the work that we did, and we're going to feel embarrassed about that. Well, the only way that we can solve that is to embrace the reality of what science is, which is that we are actually wrong about everything. Right? Every theory in science is wrong in some important fundamental way. Every claim that we make is somehow incomplete for how it is that science is actually working. So the goal in science is not to be right, it's to become less wrong. And if we embrace the fact that we're already wrong, then it's not a threat to have you find out errors. It's an opportunity for you to help us identify those errors so that we can improve the accuracy of our research moving forward. So we try now to take a much more humble approach to how it is we treat our findings, our evidence, and our claims, and assume that there are ways to improve them, to enhance them, to learn more. And the crowd might help us do that rather than just depending on it ourselves. The other barrier is practical. It's a pain in the ass to go open because most of the time it happens after the fact. We've already done all of the research, we've written the reports, we finally have it in press, it goes to print and then we say, oh, we should make that data available to others. And I've already forgotten where the data are. I've forgotten what they mean. I have to try to organize them again. I've just added myself a few days of work uh, that isn't going to be rewarded in any way. So the only way to solve that is to integrate the assumption of openness into our work, daily workflow that we can actually have as part of our daily process, not adding to it, means of making it so that we can make our materials and data available to others easily. And so that's why we started the Open Science Framework. Uh, it's available, OSF.io. Uh, you will create accounts, you manage your projects, uh, and when you want, if you want, ever, you can create, make parts of that open. Uh, you don't have to make any of it open ever. You can use it entirely as a private project management tool. But it makes it trivially easy for us to move things into the open uh, and to have a documented history of our entire research process. So the other thing that we can do to improve the likelihood that we'll actually move to these practices is make public declarations. We know that those are good for accountability. So these are the things that our lab is going to try to do and has been trying to do more and more each day. Right? First, as Laura said, when it's exploratory work, we say so. And we try to make it clear the distinction between confirmatory and exploratory work. When we're going to do something confirmatory, we pre-register, as Joe mentioned, with the OSA. <clears throat> we are going to show our process to the extent that we can. We may delay. We may not show you our process until after we're actually done. But sometimes we may say, let's just make this one available as we're doing it. See if people have suggestions before we actually start data collection so that we can improve the studies uh, diagnosticity in advance of actually having done the study. We're also committing to share our materials on an ongoing basis to whatever extent that we can, as well as our data. 
the Open Science Framework is the place that we do this. Uh, and if you're interested in finding out more about that, you can visit our booth, Center for Open Science. Uh, it's in the uh, pavilion. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge, as uh, the effort in this process, is the a large team past and present uh, in our lab working through these issues. And we don't think we're, gonna, we're not doing these perfectly now, uh, but what we want to do is do them better today than we did them yesterday. And the constant effort at improvement is the best means that we have for making our science more credible and more valuable for us and hopefully for the broader community. I also should acknowledge the team behind uh, Open Science Framework and the center more generally. There's a number of uh, uh, intern volunteers uh, and then full-time staff. And we have seven positions open, including postdocs and pre-docs. So come by the booth. Maybe you can work with us. Thank you for your attention. So how do we incentivize the use of the open science framework? Uh, so the, the, there are a number of different possibilities. Besides the things that, we, that I discussed here, uh, we're trying to develop means with which we can at least be acknowledged for this. The thing that we have is a strong advantage in the present situation is that the norms are universally endorsed. And we already know how we want science to be. It's just hard to do it that way. And so when norms are clear, that openness is actually just a central value in science, then showing that people are doing it is a strong incentive to help embrace the norm. And so if we can provide markers, means with which people can show that they're doing those practices, that could be a strong incentive and useful for actually adopting those practices. Thanks. Yeah, please. Um, it occurs to me that there are some devices that already exist that would be fairly easy to use. I mean, we all go through an IRB. We all have to specify our hypotheses Why not just do something simple? We all have those. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point, right? You have to go through IRB in advance, and a lot of this gets spelled out there. It might be just a matter of moving that information into a resource that can make it more available. And also on the incentive side, once upon a time when I was a graduate student, we studied unidirectional as well as bidirectional hypotheses. And perhaps because of some of the issues that have emerged, we went to a bidirectional hypothesis requirement. <coughs> So uh, Paul Rosen used to uh, often complain that in other fields, such as biology, you can say, well, we went to this island, we looked around, and wow, look, we found this new species of ant, we found this new mammal, and then you publish it in science. That's great. In psychology, we're not allowed to do that. If you say that something, you know, you can call something a fishing expedition, that's a bad thing. So with your talk and Laura's talk, I wonder if you would declare in very clear terms, now that we have this distinction between exploratory and confirmatory, and now that we have gigantic oceans of data that we can look around in, would you guys declare Fishing expeditions are wonderful. Go fish, go explore. It doesn't have to be hypothesis driven as long as you have a confirmatory stage. Would you say that? I would say as long as you say that that's what you're doing. Right, why as not long as it? you're clear yeah. yes. that you're fishing and well. not um, documenting a planned voyage of your yacht. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that's important. There's another point to make on what you said, which is these issues, if you have been reading the news in our field, are not constrained to psychology or the social behavioral sciences. They are everywhere. Uh, and we have, we have we've run this project in our, in our field, the reproducibility project, where as a co large scale collaboration, you're all welcome to join. Uh, we're trying to replicate a sample of our own studies to see what predicts reproducibility. We have the same project now in cancer biology. Uh, and the same sorts of issues are present in that uh, area of research. We may be doing it in neurodegeneration soon as well. Uh, so these are pervasive challenges that the field faces, 
as a field of science because the incentive issues are very similar across disciplines. Time. Thank you very much.